Hello everyone, my name is Manolis Finaralakis, the founder of Reality Crowd TV, and welcome to Reality Crowd TV Crowdfunding Hangouts Episode 23. Fundrise.com, a real estate crowdfunding platform, is our featured guest this evening, but we also have three other wonderful guests that will add a lot of value to this discussion that we'll be talking about regarding real estate crowdfunding. As you can see in the background, I have my property behind me, my, uh, my high-rise building. Uh, I'm just joking. I'm, I'm in New York today at a, at a crowdfunding conference, so I, um, I'm actually in a lobby and, I, and I'm delivering the show from the lobby. But for the viewers out there watching, I want to just put out a few ground rules before we begin the actual discussion. There is a Q&A application, so if anyone has any questions for any of our guests at any time, you must follow the circle of Reality Crowd TV and then you'll be able to actually submit a question through the Q&A application. Additionally, uh, all the links to all of our guests, including our wonderful sponsors from Inner 10 Capital, from Rockabilly Investments, and from Invest ATX, all of our guests, including the Rockingham Group and Justin, you can find all the information you need for all of our, all of our uh, guests who are on the show. Uh, so without further ado, let's make some introductions. So. I'm going to introduce each person individually and then I'll give each of our guests a chance to kind of give a brief introduction of themselves. And uh, we'll start with uh, Ben, uh, Benjamin Miller, the co-founder of Fundrise.com. So Ben, uh, please give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself and, uh, and a short introduction of your company. Okay, so my name is Ben Miller and I spent the last, uh, God, nearly 17 years in real estate started on private equity and went and became a real estate developer uh, in the family business, done, uh, I don't know, somewhere, fair amount of real estate uh, and uh, mostly mixed-use Washington, D.C.-centric uh, real estate. In 2009 or 10, we decided to try to raise money for our real estate deals on the Internet and allow everyone to invest, not just accredited investors, actually anyone could invest in these deals. It took us about a year to get the SEC to uh, sign off on the offering, and we guess we did the first real estate crowdfunding in the United States. That was a, uh, a very interesting experience. We did a number of those, and we ended up realizing that the uh, the technology platform Fundrise was uh, the the business we should focus on instead of just the real estate side of the of the world. And we when we uh, since then I think since about 2012, uh, it's been our main focus. We've now only uh, we put all of our real estate into hibernation, and Fundrise has uh, got a you know I don't know twenty some thousand people uh, members. We we do uh, usually a couple deals a week. We've raised a, a decent amount of money from some institutional players, and have a, a, some incredible real estate companies in, on our platform. And I think my favorites, I guess my favorite's got to be the World Trade Center guys because. Uh, the fact that I get the World Trade Center guys involved in Fundrise is really just, it's just mind, it's mind blowing. It just blows my mind. So um, uh, that's uh, the summary of Fundrise. It's, people call it real estate crowdfunding. You can also call it real estate syndication, online syndication, lending club for real estate. Everybody assumes marketplace lending for real, for real estate. Certainly there's no uh, single definition as the space matures. Wonderful, and um, and for for those people who may not be aware of uh of what of what you mean by the World Trade Center, uh, Fundrise, your platform, your real estate crowdfunding website online, recently raised 31 million, and uh, and among those who contributed were the uh, was it Silverstein Partners? Is that who did the World Trade Center? Silverstein Properties, yeah. Properties, excellent. So I'm I'm really happy to see Ben that you're getting a lot of momentum, and that's that's wonderful. Uh, so then our, our next guests uh, are, are a dynamic duo. We have uh, John Hancock and John Blackman. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian Hancock and John Blackman. And, uh, yes, <laughs> and, uh, and they are both uh, with Inner 10 Capital. So, gentlemen, please introduce yourselves. Right, Brian, why don't you go first? Hey, I'm Brian Hancock. I'm with Inner 10 Capital. Uh, we're real estate developers in the Austin, Texas area. We... Uh, during the last four or five years, have focused primarily on single-family uh, and smaller infill-type developments in the Austin area. But my background is with distressed real estate investing, and uh, you know I've owned and operated apartment complexes and, and different things. But 
over the last four or five years in Austin, the play has been uh, developing new projects. So that's really where I've spent the, the most of my time recently. But uh, we have successfully syndicated some deals online, offline. Uh, we've been trying to figure out how all this new crowdfunding stuff works. So delighted to be here and hopefully share and collaborate and learn more. Good. All right. Well, that pretty much covers us. Uh, my name is John Blackman. I'm Brian's partner in Anderson Capital. Uh, you already covered pretty much what the business does. I handle most of the operations and builder management of the company. And Brian does a lot of the fundraising points, but uh, I get to play in that space sometimes too. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. And um, and Inner Ten Capital is actually going to be one of our sponsors for a six series, or you know, give or take five or six series, where we really explore real estate crowdfunding in depth. We we really believe that. Uh, this is one of the one of the biggest industries to really enjoy what is happening in crowdfunding, specifically the equity and debt crowdfunding that is that is currently out, but also a few uh, additional provisions that will allow investors to invest uh, that will soon be released by the government as well. So our last guest is close to uh, is is actually close to me. I, I'm from Connecticut and Justin Rogers is from Connecticut, so I gotta you know give the CT pride a little bit. Um, and we have Justin Rogers, a real estate developer with the Rockingham Group. And Justin, uh, please uh, introduce yourself to the audience. My name is Justin Rogers. I work with my brother um, in Hartford, Connecticut. We, we focus on smaller multifamilies, usually three units. Uh, they're REOs, they're bank owned, usually copper stripped, they're vacant. And we rehab them. We work with a nonprofit for, for funding. In, in Hartford, and they do give us construction loans. We rehab them, and we refinance onto conventional terms uh, for cash flow. So we have pretty much a certain requirement of cash flow we're looking for out of based on just three or four units. Um, we do just mainly do the smaller unit buildings. Uh, we'd love to get into bigger buildings. We're not using any type of crowdfunding at the moment, but I'd love to learn more to see how any of the portals can work for how our business structure is set up as of now. Excellent, Justin. Well, um, you certainly have come to the right place because we're going to learn a lot about that today. And, um, and and the beauty of having you on, Justin, is you, you've heard of crowdfunding. It's beginning to build some momentum in the mainstream lexicon. But, um, you know, it's great that you're here because you have, you'll probably have some great questions for, uh, for both of these, uh, both of our guests. I know you know, ben, ben obviously has the real estate crowdfunding platform. Uh, Brian Hancock and John Blackman have both actually crowdfunded investments previously. So this is just a great, uh, a, a great um, group of people we have here today. Now what I'd like to do is uh, Fundrise actually has an, an explanatory video. So I'm going to play the video for a moment so that everyone can kind of see exactly what Fundrise is and it'll, it'll really be a good way to level set as well. So. I'm just going to share my screen here and uh, give me a moment. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> and uh, all right, and here we go. Uh, if if you guys don't hear the video playing, please let me know. And uh, and here we go. Have you ever caught yourself saying, "Why don't they put a coffee shop on my street?" Or why did they close that great movie theater I love? Do you then ask yourself, who is they? Who built the places around you? Who owns the buildings and businesses you go to? And who profits from their success? Fundrise is a new idea, one that lets you invest in local real estate and influence the way cities are built. We found that there was a problem in real estate that the financial institutions that are the normal investors in real estate don't really understand the places they're investing in, aren't really connected to them. So our idea was, let's try to make it possible to make the community our partner, and then we can deal with people who are actually the stakeholders. It's not just investment. There's more to it than investment. I think it has to be something you naturally be excited about. So what we built was a product we're excited about. I mean, it's Eric is an amazing chef. The building's in a whole neighborhood. It's also a good investment, but there's a lot of different pieces to it. I'm uh, Chef Eric Gruner Yang from Tokyo Underground. We are Washington, D.C.'s first Taiwanese ramen and dumpling shop. We are going to open up a concept called Maketo. It's going to have mixed retail, a restaurant, and also a cafe. It was really important to me to, to do this with Fundrise because it allows anybody with any type of expendable income to be able to own a part of the area that they live in. 
it means being part of the city that I live in. It means taking control um, and also being part of its growth. And the city makes me, but it's nice to now be able to make the city too. By using Fundrise, you can actually have the power to change your neighborhood, invest in what you care about, and profit from the places you go to. How it works is simple. We create a company that allows you, your friends, and your neighbors to buy shares in a piece of real estate. Your investment goes directly into the development of that property, which could be leased to a local business, like a restaurant or concert space. So by owning a piece of the company, you make money on rent from the business and appreciation of the real estate. So as your neighborhood grows, so does your investment. This would be the first time that I get to walk into a place that I own. I think it's also going to change the way that I interact with other people in the neighborhood. You know, you're all walking in there knowing that you're sharing something together, not just an experience of being in a place, but also ownership of it. We want to build a base of people that we know that will always come to the business. But even if Maketo is never there, these people will always own property. And they get to have a little piece of the pie in the area that they live in. We think that Fundrise can change the power dynamic of who builds cities. So all of a sudden, you can come together with your friends and your family and actually start changing your environment. You can actually change the fabric of your street, of your city, and, and actually make money doing that. With Fundrise, you have the power to build your city. Excellent. Uh, so that was a great video. Um, so with that, Ben, um, so you you guys are are very unique, and and um, for a lot of our a lot of our guests, I'm sorry. Let me uh, stop sharing the screen. A lot of a lot of our guests um, might be um, might actually be viewing crowdfunding for the first time, and they might only know the the current model, which is the donation in exchange for a reward model. Uh, and so, as a result of the 2012 Jobs Act, there's actually a lot of new changes that are coming down the pike that have essentially allowed you to do what you do on Fundrise, and you, you were among one of the first companies to actually use some of the old regulations as well to really be able to, to do this with the, with, by leveraging technology. So, can you tell us, uh, in layman's terms, what exactly, are, how exactly are you able to essentially uh, raise capital for investment or even raise debt for investment on your platform. How does all this coming about and, and how are you able to do what you're doing? Well, so, I mean, it's, it's funny. I think the first offering that we did this was 2010. This is four years later. So they, there's, when you ask that question, it, it, it depends on which, which era we did it in. You know, back in 2010 when we did this, Jobs Act didn't exist and we used a regulation called Regulation A which is, um, I think we were like one of only only two people in the country to use it at the time, and that led us, uh, the SEC actually had to, like, it was basically like going public, like what Facebook or Link Twitter did. It was an insane proposition to go public for $350,000. I should have gone public for $20 billion like Facebook did. That would have been a much smarter move. <laughs> but anyways, uh, it took... Uh, and that took nine months, and and it was uh, it was an outrageous proposition. And then we did it multiple times, which is even more insane. But the 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 basic structure of it is uh, it's like a single it was like a single property public company where people could buy shares in that property, uh, and we set it at a hundred dollars a share, so that basically anybody could afford to do it. Uh, even I mean at the time people thought we were insane. And I, I, you know, I, I think maybe they were more right than I was now that I'm like kind of looking back at it. Uh, and now the way we structure it is that we, we form, we actually have a, a, a central company or an SPE, a special purpose entity, where the investors invest into this entity and then we issue notes uh, back to them tied to their investment because uh, the real estate company doesn't want to have the hundred or, or, or hundreds of investors where I have I literally have hundreds of investors or and I think I have maybe a total of like a thousand investors and that's uh, that's that's fundrise's business right it's to, it's to have many investors to manage uh, customer service manage having essentially the idea of a retail customer base 
and the, the by and large, the real estate developer wants me to deal with that, wants me to take that problem from them. And then uh, also they, there's, a, there's a question of like who has the liability for these retail investors. And so, that, so we now have a central entity. So it's very similar to what Lending Club does. If you look how Lending Club structures their business, where the investor now um, invests into, they still get the financial performance of the underlying uh, property, but, they, but the deal the deal docs and the, and, the, and the administration and the oversight all is handled by us, Fundrise. Interesting. So, so your, your platform makes it easy not only for investors but also for developers because it, the, your proprietary platform acts as the reporting mechanism, the, the way that everything is tracked. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, we, we found that, I mean, the, the real estate developer, and I'm, I, I, I guess I'm still, call, I think I qualify still as a real estate developer, we, you want to focus on the real estate. And it's actually like, a, it's, it's, it's like a, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the real estate company wants to do transactions, wants to do deals, basically says, like, how do I get money as, as efficiently and as quickly and as easily as possible? And... And that's basically what we needed to do for them, while the investor has basically says like, well, I want you know good reporting. I want someone in the, who understands real estate to be kind of my like, you know, my looking out for me, right? They 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 need somebody who understands this business to be their um, guardian angel or their intermediary essentially. Which I, I I had originally hoped that you could put them directly together. And, and part of our proposition is we're transparent. Even, even though we still have a, um, this intermediate entity, you, there's transparency through. So you actually can see who your investors are. You can see who, 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 who are interested in being your investors. I, I think that the transparency is critical. Uh, for, for, and it, it creates an accountability back to the developer, and it also creates uh, an opportunity for the developer to, to um, have a deeper relationship with the investor that they, if they want to do more than the necessary reporting and send articles and send uh, pictures about their projects, that's great. I, I'm happy. And often, often the, the developer will get investors. Um, they will go. They usually go around us and write bigger checks um, in a different place in the capital stack, or, or, or have a different relationship with it with the with the um, developer than we're having, and and that requires. Uh, a, 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 an investment in time and effort that if the developer puts in, I'm happy for him to, to basically take that benefit. So it's um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a slightly different model. It's kind of a combination of transparency and intermediation at the same time, trying to basically intermediate where it's basically what I found is had to be intermediated and then be transparent where is where possible. Okay, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the the, the technology is is the is the key disruptor here, and um, and in a sense, uh, it is kind of making it more directly connected, but still requires that intermediation at certain points. Um, you know, I want to I want to open up to John uh, to um, Brian and John for a moment. I, I know you you gentlemen have done real estate crowdfunding before, knowing what you know about how your experiences went. Do you have any questions for Ben about Fundrise that you that you gentlemen would like to bring up? I don't know if I have any questions specifically. I, I do know the different platforms fairly well. I mean, we've, we've done a pretty good survey of most of the folks. And to my knowledge, I think Fundrise is the only one that is allowing for that transparency that Ben talked about. Um, one of my major uh, complaints about the other platforms is that I don't have any dialogue or uh, back and forth with investors. Um, it's, it's real hard to develop a relationship with people that way. Um, and it also it just creates a lot of problems, whereas it would be a lot easier if I did have the dialogue with the investors. Uh, but Ben's right. From a developer standpoint, we very much want to minimize the amount of overhead uh, there's a lot of accounting and tax stuff, and you know, there's a lot of securities laws involved with raising money, and I feel like I know that stuff pretty well, but it is a big time suck. It would be a lot easier to have somebody whose job it is to, to kind of focus on that. That way we can be out operating our business and 
really just trying to find more investors and, and really have a nice relationship with our investors instead of having to deal a lot with the, the day to day and you know uh, a lot of the K1 distributions, all the stuff that has to go on when you syndicate real estate transactions. I mean, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, it's, it's almost a lot like a politician trying to get reelected and so you don't want to spend all your time fundraising or fundraising, right? You want to be out there getting work done. So the nice thing about portals are that they kind of manage that for you and it kind of takes it off your plate so like you said, you can get back to hammering nails, so to speak. Well, another advantage too is you don't have to hire staff to do all of that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, you know, basically hiring a contractor to do it on an as-needed basis and that prevents us from having to, to charge developer fees to cover overhead for staff for those sorts of functions. Absolutely. It, uh, I mean, and, and like you guys said, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of real estate people too, um, as you mentioned, they're good with the numbers that, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily good at, um, you know, the, the social aspect, the way to bring people in, uh, having this kind of a, an ecosystem that, that really Fundrise is, is, is a great way for, for this direct connections to occur with investors. And, and, uh, and I agree with you. I think it's, I think it's causing a lot of people to uh, realize that, um, you know, it, it is essentially bringing people together in a way that, that technology is, is allowing to happen. Um, I wanted to ask actually uh, Justin for a moment as well. Um, Justin, as a developer, you, you mentioned early on that you, you've focused a lot of your attention. I know over nine years you, you amassed uh, seven properties, I think a total of 23 units, and I'll let you, I'll let you tell more about that. But you, um, you, you really got excited about real estate because you, you want to go bigger now. You, you had, you've had some good success with, uh, with a lot of your properties, but um, you know, from your perspective as a developer who's just under getting into real estate at the moment, like for the crowdfunding side of it, what questions do you have uh, for Ben regarding, you know, r regarding the process for you to actually begin to bring deals? Can you can you give us, you know, may maybe one of your typical deals? Can you tell us what a typical deal that you do looks like, and then ask Ben specific questions to see, you know, if, if they would even um, entertain something like that. So. Go ahead and kind of tell us a little bit about yourself in that regard. Um, well, it, things involved, especially over the past like, couple of years, we ended up working better with um, or getting the nonprofit to help us uh, with their loans. Um, so things are better now as far as their deals and what we look for. Um, just take, I guess I would love to know how crowdfunding and fundraise could help with the long-term hold strategy. and. As of now, you know, we always have to come up with the 20, 25% down for the construction loan, and then when we refinance out, um, it's typically, you know, hard money loan. We refinance out, buy them out, but we still have our 20, 25% still stuck in the loan. So with that 20, 25%, we could still give a good return um, to investors, but I guess I want to see if the, there's any portal, any way that um, crowdfunding could could apply uh, with a longer term strategy. And uh, and Ben, I'll, I'll let you handle that. Um, if you can kind of tell us kind of, you know, do you do buy and holds for a longer term strategy and, and do you require a large down payment? Um, kind of give us some specifics on that. Yeah, uh, so there's two questions in there. One is basically about a long term hold and two is about a, essentially, a co-investment from us from a real estate company, a sponsor. So, um, for, for the second question, the, you have—I mean, at least my point of view—is you have to have sponsors, skin in the game. Um, that's not anything new. Everybody in real estate industry would take that as normal. Uh, it's 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 a litmus test, basically. How much is how much is meaningful depends on the size of the deal, the the size of the developer. Uh, you know, there's deals you do a hundred million dollar deal and a million dollars is the skin of the game, right? But but if you're doing a you know million dollar deal, you know, is a hundred thousand dollars skin of the game? I, I you know it maybe, right? So it's so it it's it's varies deal by deal, um, but it, it, you definitely want to look at the deal and say you know how invested is the developer in this because it, uh, it, just to look at what's happening in the industry, it's bad things happen when there's not a lot of skin in the game uh, generally. Now there are 
exceptions to that, but it's it's something you just have to you have to manage. Uh, in terms of long term hold, I I mean I as a real estate developer, you know, I mean your dream is the long term hold money, right? There's just when you look at the institutional capital out there, you don't see people who want to be long term holders. Uh, you know, the private equity guys are 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 wanting it out. They want their twenty. Well, I guess these days maybe eighteen percent IRR. Uh, you know, in, in annual return. Uh, the you know insurance companies and and those types of players are aren't going to go down down scale here to the smaller real estate deals. But so I I be, you know we began with this idea that like wouldn't local people or wouldn't individual people be excited about long term cash flow? And I I didn't we didn't really find that. I mean we didn't see. That the retail investor ended up being a long-term investor, um, the way that that we, as a real estate company, would have would have also hoped. Uh, that the, the 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 retail investor's point of departure, if you think about, like you get into their head, you know, when I say retail, I mean I'm still meaning, I, I, you you could put retail accredited investor and retail unaccredited basically in the same bucket because they're not that they're not that different. Uh, their point of departure is stocks and bonds in the public market. So it's Apple. It's I mean most of them don't even own bonds. Maybe they're in a bond fund, and their expectation is to be able to sell that that security when they whenever they need to. And they you don't see people other than maybe their IRA think in the long term, and and that's I mean I think it's also part of their problem with the markets is that liquidity. Although everybody wants it, it, I think that the liquidity premium people are paying for it is um, it's not always to their benefit. And I think you see that if you look at public REITs, how public REITs are priced versus the private market doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, if you know what I mean, where um, if a, a company is public and it's a real estate investment trust, the, the, the REIT ETF is charging, I think it's, it's not charging, it's um, trading at a 3% yield. 3% yield is uh, fraud equity, right? This is the really yield on equity. So, and, and in the private markets, you'd be buying properties, you know, s- probably seven to eight per six to eight percent uh, of uh, yield on cost. So that's a pretty hefty premium for liquidity. But the the retail investor wants that liquidity, and so they haven't been the long term investor. I mean, there's it happens. It, there are ways to do it. But it, 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 liquidity mechanisms are critical in order to make that possible. Okay, actually, uh, as a follow-up to that, um, do you guys do properties as small as three-family houses, um, it, or or are you guys no longer in that space? Because uh, yeah, because I, I, it sounds like now now that you have a lot of the capital you raised for the platform, and you have um, a, a lot of liquidity with uh, Silverstein Properties and and the other. Um, Institutional players, do you guys go as low as three-family houses anymore, or are you are you guys looking for bigger, bigger properties now? I mean, we we're we're still doing some smaller. I mean, single-family homes. I mean, when you say three single, I mean, are you talking like a three-unit, a three-unit apartment building, basically, like, like yeah. a, or a quad? Like, yeah. I mean that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they really you see a split. I mean, when does something stop being single-family home and start being commercial property? Um, you know, I would say quad starts acting, it starts cro- crossing over a four, you know, a four-unit apartment building, and and it, and it varies city by city by zoning because there's a point when you get get um, you start uh, qualifying to for affordable housing, affordable housing and rent control and things like that that are a nightmare, and so um, and in, in in San Francisco it's I think it's one number and DC is another, so you want to there's a sweet spot in where you want to be the size of the project. Uh, we come from a commercial development background, commercial real estate, so like our bread and butter. All the investors you look at, like our investor group, you know, it's Ratner's from Forest City. It's like, uh, I mean, Plank, for, if, if you know Scott Plank, who's buying all sorts of commercial properties. So commercial is like where we are strongest, and single family home is something that we've done some of, but it's not really our, our it's, not, we're, it's not our mainstay. Um, so we like to do occasionally just because it's a good learning. I think there's some benefits to it for us, but it's it's not really going to be our uh, you know if you were to say like if the 
whose niche is, is it? That's not really our niche. Okay, interesting. Uh, just just so I can just so that the audience too can um, can kind of uh, un understand exactly how you guys work at present too. Uh, you guys right now are are really focusing in on Title Two or accredited investor um, crowdfunding. So as a result of the 2012 Jobs Act, there was uh, four provisions, three or four provisions that related to crowdfunding. <laughs> the one that's been fully implemented is Title II, which is general solicitation of accredited investors. And an accredited investor is an individual who makes 200000 a year or is worth a million in net worth excluding their personal residence. So. Are, are you guys solely working in that realm at the moment, or are you still doing the Regulation A where you could bring unaccredited investors in? Yeah, um, I mean, we're, yeah, so this is, this is a good technical question. So Title II, where they are, people also call it uh, Rule 506C, which is general solicitation, solicitation of, uh, for accredited investors. It's the easiest thing to work within. It's, um, it's fairly... Uh, 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 manageable regulatory regime to, to, to uh, use and uh, we do we're doing it like everybody else practically on the internet um, it's not our it's we we really believe in getting at the unaccredited investor uh, it's part of our, our just our, our point of view of, of how real estate ought to work and that the I, I don't think that the distinction between accredited and unaccredited really makes much sense it's it's a distinction that breaks down when you look at like who are our investor. You know, we, we've done these investor, these fundraises where you know anybody can do it. And who's investing? You know, real estate analysts at huge real estate companies for NATO, huge huge real estate companies that know real estate better than almost any accredited investor. So I don't, I don't, I think that the unaccredited unaccredited break is. I get the logic of it from a securities regulatory point of view, but it's not. Uh, is it's a it's a it's a problem that we keep trying to get at, and we we do regulation A filings that are all you know they take many months and are enormous undertakings. We've done interstate offerings, which are um, you know certain states have tried to exempt the uh, uh, or change the exemptions, and you could probably speak to it better than me, but it's uh, it, you know Michigan, Georgia, uh, Kansas have all tried to to get ahead of the Jobs Act's implementation of Title III. And we've, so, but the, but the, the, the current regulatory regime around allowing everyone to invest is a complete mess. It's just unbelievably difficult. And so we, you know, al although we keep at it, and, I, and, I, and it's not a, like a profit center by any means, it's, um, it's something that we will continue to, to chase. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, and uh, jo John and um, John and uh, Brian, do you have any um, any perspective on uh, on the unaccredited side of the spectrum? I, I know. Uh, yeah, I'd like you guys to chime in on that. Yeah, it, it's definitely a mess. Yeah, I just, uh, <laughs> I, we won't even dip in, into those waters until the new regs are finished this year. At this point. I mean, kudos to Fundrise for doing it. I'm on the you're insane side to try it, but I'm, I'm glad they did it because it kind of broke the ice. Um, but I think that once the new regulations come out later this year, depending on how they fall out, then those doors might might open. And I'm, I look forward to that. I think that's going to be a great game changer, but right now we're, we're still going to have to wait. Yeah, we're doing a lot of investor gathering exercises, uh, contemplating that the rules may change later this year. And I hear different things from different people about what's really going to happen, how that's going to come down um, later this year or early next year or whenever, whenever it is. But uh, there's a lot of technical things, and I'm sure I don't want to probably bore all the audience to death with it, but uh, we actually looked at doing a Regulation A plus or what would be precede a A plus type offering in anticipation of Titles 3 and 4 coming out. Um, and kind of how we would navigate that since we're shooting kind of at a moving target right now. And uh, I think we came to the same logical conclusion that most people do right now. We're just going to try and operate under Title III until we know what the rules are. It's kind of hard to anticipate how all the rules are actually going to lay down to try and do a lot of that stuff right now. So the alternative is to do uh, a full-up 
Regulation A offering, but there's challenges with that in terms of going state by state by state. And if we're operating <coughs> online, I have no capacity to know where my investors are going to come from. Another interesting thing, too, is we actually have a lot of international investors in some of our projects. So there's also other regulations like Regulation S that you have to navigate. There's Patriot Act rules. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. So the goal, like Ben stated earlier, is kind of, uh, uh, you know, good relationship with our investors. Hopefully most of them are local. Um, a lot of, uh, if you get local investors, it solves a lot of problems. You can actually close offerings out under uh, different uh, exemptions to the securities laws. But uh, that kind of defeats the purpose of having an online presence because you can get investors from all over the United States. Um, so from a developer standpoint, uh, it, it's definitely a mess. I think Ben is a absolutely accurate with that. And I, uh, I don't know how everything's going to lay down at the end of the day, but right now it's just easiest to do stuff under 506C and, and the Title II rules, which kind of leads to a lot of other problems around reasonableness tests for accreditation. Um, and so there's a bunch of third-party services that have sprung up for that. Um, that offer services for, for reasonableness, but nobody kind of knows what the rules are going to be if a deal goes sideways. So where does the liability ultimately lie for those reasonableness screening procedures? So uh, a lot of the portals have rightfully kind of indemnify themselves of a lot of that risk, but it's kind of like a hot potato. Nobody knows, you know, nobody wants the risk, but ultimately if I don't have direct dialogue with my investors, how would I possibly be screening them reasonably? So that's kind of why I think the Fundrise model works a lot better because it's more of a, you actually get to know who your investors are. These other portals, um, if they are, they're basically intermediating that whole relationship with the investors, well then you got to really think through how, how you uh, how you sign your, you know, the engagements that you sign with the portal and, and who has the, the liability for making sure those people really are accredited under the Title II rules. Anyway, I could go on and on and on about this for hours, but I'm, I'm probably boring everybody to death. Okay. Uh, well, no, you know what? Uh, you, definitely not. I, I think it's very important that um, that everyone knows kind of the, the compliance concerns because it is, it is going to be a big part of this industry. But Justin, uh, I'm sure you you have a lot more questions, and and I do too a little bit. So, Justin, um, before I ask a few questions, do you have any more questions for Ben? I uh, based on his response. Um, well, I guess I was wondering as far as you know interest rates and um, what are the what are the investors mainly looking for to get out of uh, you know the deals? What what are they looking for as um, as far as it, you know, interest rates and whether it's equity, the terms. Yeah, so I think that's for me. Um, I mean, generally, I mean, this is uh, my, I would say what, what I've seen is that the, I mean, the, the, the online investor is, is looking for a return. I mean, they're definitely return centric and, um, you know, you're, you're, on the equity side, they're definitely, they're, you, do you want to be above 15? I mean, they're, everybody promises 20, and that's a bunch of nonsense. Unless you're doing condo or, or, or single-family home you know, flips here on the equity side, uh, you, you, know, you usually don't see 20. And I, I was on some panel with like this group called Westbrook, which is this huge private equity fund, $20 billion private equity fund, so like one of the biggest. And he was honest, actually, was floored. He was very honest about his returns. He said that he's... He never sees in all the deals they've done. They never actually end up seeing, um, you know, much. They never see twenty. Maybe like I mean, once in a while, and they telling their investors they expect twelve. And so um, that's on a blended basis, including losses. So you know, they may do twenty deals, and they'll not all of them will perform equally. So they're not doing twelve per deal. But I, I mean, investor expectations is a, is a probably above fifteen on the equity, and then on debt, I mean. For, it depends on the deal. Are you are you doing hard money loans, and then those are usually more than ten. Um, so it's it's uh, I would say slightly cheaper than 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 the normal market, but I think it's ending up. I mean, 
if you if you underprice it too much, you really don't see demand. I mean, you'll see demand fall off, and that's and that's something that I think a lot of real estate companies uh, come to us. They're like, I want cheap money, then and I want it, you know, I want it now, and <laughs> and um, I, you know, it's it's a it's a little bit like a if you ever if you think about it, you going to the public markets, and if you go to the public markets, you misprice your shares. Either you don't, it doesn't sell, or you or if you if you I mean. So there's a there's a is a is a challenge in in the sort of uh, sort of best efforts approach to fundraising, and so um, uh, I mean the pricing I, I would say is is I mean, I, you know my goal is to try to keep it close to market because I think that's what investors deserve and that's also a better long term business for the developer but the developer doesn't like usually like that um, you know generally I mean it's a uh, it, I, if I were under ten, which I, I don't know you guys that well, I've, I don't think I've ever actually talked to you guys. But you know, having more capital is actually, and as a developer myself, more capital with that moves more quickly is more valuable than price. That the difference between fifteen and fourteen or thirteen is in sixteen. That is like I know developers love to focus on that and negotiate about it, but it just doesn't matter. As I mean, but it, it's not going to move the needle deal by deal, but it's an obsession of the developer when it comes to negotiating, and so that's a, that's what I would say about pricing. It's everybody wants to talk about it, but I think it's really overrated. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and we're, our goal is to kind of be long-term greedy. So you know, I would rather have a, a long-term, meaningful relationship with investors for 20 or 30 years for them to be getting market rates, for us to be overperforming what we. Of signing up for in our offerings and have the capital be plentiful and do more deals as a result of it than trying to shave off a point or two. Ben's absolutely right. That's noise. Um, you know, and we very much like to, to share our profits with our investors. Um, I'm and obviously it's you know our deals are shorter term deals, so moving the needle matters a little bit less your duration is shorter. Versus if it was a five or ten year commercial project, well then the rates probably do matter a little bit more, or probably a lot more in those scenarios than most of our shorter term development deals. Yeah, you're going to be living with money for a lot longer. We only use it for six months, you know, so yeah, or a year or so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. So the the question that I had too is, um, what how how would someone start? With uh, with a fundrise, for instance, or with another funding platform. Of course, you you go and you register for the site, but the one thing I saw about fundrise, which is which is um, something I'm just curious about, is you guys have um, almost a community aspect to it, which I love, and you have the ability to talk with investors directly. But are you as fundrise? What if a developer goes, creates a community, and brings their own people to their community, and they want to fund a deal? That they brought to to fundrise, would you deny them the ability to fund the deal, even if they have people who are willing to invest in the deal? Are you curating in that level of detail, or if they, or is your platform a way for them to really bring their own investors in and use your functionality to work? How how does your platform work in that regard? Are you a curation platform? Or are you a listing board? Okay, so yeah, we're definitely curated. Uh, I, I curate is a funny word too, but it's uh, yeah. You 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 have to underwrite the deals or evaluate them because um, I mean I don't know how you survive in the long run if you're if you're not. But you know there's a there's, a, there's probably an opportunity for at least I mean maybe one listing platform guy survives and and uh, that that's I mean I think an interesting model. But it's not it's not for it's not I mean I just we just don't have the um, I just don't have the stomach for it. It, it just, I, you know, I have too much of an opinion about real estate to be able to, to do that, which is good, you know, maybe good, maybe bad. Um, on how it works, and, the, and we do something slightly different than everyone else, which is we, we, we require a real estate company to create a profile. Actually, you can create a profile for free, and you can start connecting with investors for free, and it's, and it, and it's, uh, it's kind of like LinkedIn, but for investment. And... Um, some companies get it and they just start doing it and they connect and they basically tell stories and they end up with meeting you know dozens or hundreds of investors. 
some real estate companies don't get it, and they're like, oh, why do I have to do that? Can't you just give me the money? I just want the money. Like, why, why do I have to do that? And, um, you know, I mean, to some extent we find that, like, as a, like, well, it probably is not worth working with this real estate developer because they're just going to be, you know, they're just going to be, uh, um, how do I say this complimentary? It, then you do a deal, and, you, and you, whether you, you may put your back into it, you may help them succeed, but then they're just going to basically shop you and, and not be loyal, and it's just pointless. What's the point of that? I mean, that's just not, that's not, good. That's not good for us, and I mean, ultimately exactly what um, uh, John was saying, that you, you know, it's, it's about long-term businesses, and, and the, the guy who really wants, to, and the person who becomes very, very focused on transaction at, at that moment, I mean, that's the mentality that gets you into trouble when, when you know, I, mean, I went through 08 and, and I've been through 01, and the deals that go bad are the ones where people were in a rush. I mean, it's, it's different. It's, this, I'm a commercial guy, right? So this is single family home stuff is faster, it's a faster business. But um, uh, so we basically want you to be, we were trying to create a network effect around people connecting with developers, and we let people connect directly, and we let John, you know, if he has some deal, this is the point about. Uh, do we let people do deals that we don't underwrite? And so we can't do them on the platform because if we do them on the platform, we sit with a liability, but we didn't do the underwriting. So it doesn't work, right? And that's a, it's kind of a weird, we sit in a kind of a weird limbo place because we want people to connect, but we can't let them transact on the platform generally without underwriting it. And so there's a, there's a process there we're trying to figure out how do you have both this connectivity and transparency at the same time have standards and and underwriting. And that's something we haven't figured out. But but if you end up having a hundred investors or, or more, I mean, I don't know how many uh, our average investor developer has, but definitely more than a hundred. It's so easy to take them offline. It's so easy to just uh, connect with them and send them deals and send them deal docs. I mean that there's a value to the online transaction engine. There's a value to the online. I mean, we have all the administration, you know, auto generation of tax documents and and uh, and distribution of of uh, of you know your your whether it's an interest rate payment or it's a just a distribution of of um, of from an equity uh, investment or you're doing reporting. All that's built. We built that originally for ourselves, um, but I'm not, we haven't figured out how to let people use it and yet also not underwrite it. I mean, it's just so that's a, so we're in a quandary on that point, and right now we just sit in this place being like, you connect, and if you end up doing something that we can't underwrite or we can't uh, um, focus on, you know, just do it directly off platform and whatever, good for you. Because it's, it's I mean, I just don't believe you want to be. Uh, I mean, this is internet's not kind to intermediaries, and so I just it's not. It's a philosophically, we're we're we embrace this idea of we're going to be transparent, and there's going to be things that happen. That we won't make any money on, and that's you know if an investor invests in a deal and 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 the developer gets an investor, everybody's happy. So why should we try to stop that? Wow. Okay. So so you you're providing a platform for your investors to connect with each other, and you know full well that maybe they'll take it offline and do, they it, always do, do. it themselves. They always, they always do. do. Every transaction always always happens. Um, I I just think it. I, I, at some point I can quantify it. And say like, look, here's a basically this additional value you're getting for free, but it's it's just I mean it just doesn't matter. I mean it doesn't matter because it's not really. I mean look, so if somebody raises two three hundred thousand dollars extra offline, big deal. I mean that's great. Okay. No, I mean I I, I kind of like that mentality where, you know, if you're going to do it as a platform, you have the say in the underwriting, but. You're not discouraging people to necessarily go offline and do it because it's no longer in your purview. Whatever happens to them is their own risk. So that that makes sense. But let me ask you this: Why why can't there be a listing platform where people are allowed to list their deals and if they self-promote themselves, um, why why wouldn't there be why isn't that a valid business model? I guess. Well, I mean, I, I, okay, I, I mean, maybe somebody else can answer that. But I, I, I didn't say it wasn't valid. I just said it was difficult. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> My opinion on that one is then if, if you don't underwrite and you're a portal promoter and so you're, you're effectively a listing agent, then when you come to that site, you don't know if you're going to hit a landmine. So you've got 
an immediate brand issue comes to mind. Well, if I go to that listing company, well, I guess you just better better make sure you get your big boy boots on because whatever you look at on that site is, you know, there there could be a trap or a mine behind any one of them. Whereas because Funrise does their own underwriting, you know that they've you know gone through that due diligence and that if you're going to do a deal on there, that they've looked at it and that you're less likely to run into issues. So it reflects well on Funrise, and then they're only going to get quality promoters. And then investors know that hey, I've got a good brand here. So if I want to go to a, look at a lot of deals, I know that the good ones are going to be on Funrise because they've done their homework. Okay, I okay. guess I guess I could see that. Um, well, because, uh, let me just, I just want to clarify again. I didn't say I, I said I said I think I specifically said there may be even one that survives, but oh, I think okay. there, there's going to be a really difficult period that they'll have to overcapitalize it ahead of or when the recession happens and all these deals start blowing up, uh, and that's going to happen to this industry. Um, you know how how are you prepared for that? I mean, how, it's gonna it's gonna be very expensive. And uh, it's going to be expensive for everybody, right? I mean, this is like it's endemic to real estate. So, um, but you know, there's a there there. I mean, I could make an argument for a listing platform business model. Uh, it's just not for us. It's just not. It's just you know, I don't come from. It's, it's really a brokerage mentality that makes that potentially work. And this is not. This is not my background. It's not background of people here. And so, um, this is not where we ended up. Okay. No, it, it makes sense, and, and I don't mean to push that issue, but I, I, I actually am excited about Title Three, the unaccredited investor, and that's why, you know, to to me, if someone figures out how to do, you know, an unaccredited investor platform like a Kickstarter for, you know, unaccredited investors, you know, the the model of Kickstarter, they they don't promote you. They you're just allowed to use their platform to list, and then if you want to if you want to make, you know. If you want to get your project funded, you have to go out and promote it. You have to do the social media. You have to bring investors in. I, I'm wondering if there's a way to basically d disclaim everything uh, in that capacity because you know some people maybe have only done one or two deals, right? Real estate deals, and maybe they want to, you know, th they want to use this mechanism to bring uh, to bring people they know and and uh, you know real estate investor associations, whatever the case may be. If if you don't have a long enough track record, a lot of these platforms may not work. Um, so what what are these people to do? I guess is my question. Uh, how how are they going to take advantage of crowdfunding if all the platforms are putting up some barriers to entry, so to speak? Well, yeah. if, I, if I may put a cautionary tale out there, um, just because there are crowdfunding portals, they're not magic bullets. So just because you think you've got a deal and I'm just going to go to a crowdfunding portal and voila, all my money's going to show up. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So you still need to have a good reputation. You still need to have a good network. You need to bring some of your own investors to those portals, which will then bring momentum, and then other investors that you don't know will see that momentum and then want to get on the train. If you just show up thinking that you're going to put a listing up on any crowdfunding portal, you're probably not going to succeed. Um, so keep that in mind when you're, when you're out there crowdfunding your deals. You still need a good network of folks. You still need to be well represented online. You still need to have people, something to show, and you still need that track record. Yeah, we actually have a deal we're crowdfunding right now on a different portal, and uh, I've probably found 90 or 95 percent of the money that's been subscribed so far. But the idea is, I get it to that point, and then hopefully we get the other 50 percent from the portal because we've shown that we can get it to that point. And in the in the process of doing that, we get a lot of the back end functionality, a lot of the technology. John's actually a software developer, or was a software developer. In a previous life. Is a recovering software developer. So we could we could easily write a lot of similar stuff, but then you gotta maintain the code, you gotta maintain all the compliance documents and all that. I mean, there's just a, a ton of work behind all of that. Again, we wanna keep our focus on on real estate. And being able to do the real estate piece, all of the crowdfunding piece is a, a business all by itself, and you can't do many things well all at the same time. Yeah. So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we, you definitely need to be able to bring investors to the deals. I see the portals a lot as, uh, you know, a good way to organize the investment. 
and to be able to get access to some new investors that you would not have had but for the portal. But the idea that you're going to put something up and then a bunch of people who know nothing about you, know nothing about your track record, are going to scramble and invest in your thing, I think is, uh, is, is foolhardy. Um, I think that the, the better model is you raise a lot of the, the, the money yourself through your existing network and you use the portal more as a technology hub. And, uh, you know, you actually get other investors in, in the course of that. Maybe they fill up some of the subscription, but I, I don't think that it's very likely that the portal is going to find everybody for you for your whole raise. I mean, maybe your experience is different, Ben, but that's been our experience thus far with our deals. And I wanted to respond to that by asking a question, John and Justin, and you guys, because there were multiple questions in what you said, Manolis, and, and I, I think there's interesting ones that I'd like to hear. Um, these these guys' thoughts on so um, so title three you know and I'm going to talk about it in a way that I how I think it'll play out but I could be wrong so title three will, will require the broker the the portal to be uh, vetting and underwriting the deals I think that the SEC will require that I almost I'm pretty sure it's by statute so the SEC has no choice it's not going to be a posting platform posting platform is not available if you are going to be offering to undercredited investors. So, um, and, and, and the people who are sort of least, who deserve least to be uh, uh, investing in unvetted deals are people who are unaccredited. So, but, um, but there, are, there are a lot of requirements around, around this Title III. You can only raise a million dollars a year. Uh, you have to basically uh, uh, do annual audits and other reporting, um, you know, it, and there's a there's a, there's a there's strict liability. There's a lot of complexity and and risk and and um, limitations on it. I mean, it, is this? Do you think that this is a, a an exemption you would be using if it was available with all the um, baggage it comes with? No. No. Not not <laughs> as it's currently written. But no. In a, in a word, no. I mean. You know, I guess if you were capped at a million dollars a year and, and that meant a lot for your development business, I mean, that alone is a, a very arduous constraint for a lot of developers. But uh, you talk about all the other baggage that comes with it, too. I, I just don't see it being workable the way that the rules that I've seen are going to be implemented. I, I think the more uh, charming prize is sort of the Title IV stuff, the Regulation A plus stuff that I keep hearing about um, on down the line. So we're kind of hopeful that that has more promise. But Title III, I, I just think, is a the lost cause the way I've I've seen it, the rules for it presented. Yeah, the cost benefit is just not there. It's the overhead is really steep. You can't raise that much, and uh, you're going to be dealing with a lot of little investors. So. I mean, you could do it. Some, someone I'm sure out will go and do it, but to me, it just seems like a lot of extra work. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. What a what about technology, though? Do Do you believe that technology, with with the way that Title Three is currently written, um, but the technology has nothing to do with it. It's more the financial restrictions. There's only the million dollars is all you can do, um, and that per year. And then the audited books, like it's a huge financial hit to have to do those audited reports. So no amount of technology is going to modify my dollars. And so I'm, I'm still inside that little cage no matter how much tech you throw at it. Okay. But, but see, here's, here's the thing. For a smaller investor who, who might, who a million dollars for a smaller investor, depending on the type of deals you're doing, that can mean multiple properties. A million dollars may not mean much. Uh, to certain people because they're farther along in their investment aptitude. But the the million dollar level right there, I think for a lot of people, especially uh, investors who, who who are part of RIAs, right? Real estate investor groups. Do you see some sort of benefit to them using that model where they can get unaccredited investors? Instead of buying the books that gurus sell, maybe they could actually spend their money on actually investing in real estate on, on the unaccredited investor realm. Do you see some some benefit there, or or you guys are completely convinced that it's just not going to work for anyone? Well, I, I think that if you're talking about RIAs wishing to band together, 
I mean, there's existing exemptions under 504 and other exemptions that are, a heck, to me, a heck of a lot less arduous than a lot of these Title III rules that are being proposed. And I, I think a lot of the states are coming up with their own set of exemptions now to kind of head some of the SEC stuff off at the pass that I think is going to be a lot easier than some of the Title III stuff. So if that's your sort of uh, your scenario, I just think that there's easier ways to do it right now unless you have uh, you know people in other states. I mean, a lot depends on whether or not you're going to use general solicitation too. Um, you could use the old rules and have up to 35 non-accredited as well if you had a pre-existing substantive relationship with some of the investors, which may or may not be the case in some of these RIAs. So a lot depends on the specific circumstances of the deal. I just think, to a lot of the points John talked about, you know, audited financial statements and, you know, all this extra burden for smaller deals especially is going to be, it's just going to be a lot of overhead for people to deal with that are going to be promoters in these deals. Yeah, so to really make that audited financial costs fly and to spread it out, you want to raise the full amount. So let's say you're a small guy and you only want to do a $200,000 raise or $100,000 raise, you still have to have all the, those audited financials, so that's certainly a lot of extra cost. Also, the rules are not done yet and there's a lot of lobbying that is trying to change the rules as we know them today, so they might be completely different by the time they come out. So I'm still on the wait and see approach. I think that crowdfunding from non-accredited has the potential to be a big game changer if it's done in the right way, such that the barriers are low enough, but they still protect people. Uh, I think the current rules are not there yet, and so I'm hopeful that uh, the lobbyists will come up with something that, uh, that that works better than what we currently have. Okay, very good. And um, and, and I know we're we're about two minutes over. I know you gentlemen are uh, are extremely busy. I just wanted each of you to kind of give a last word as to. Where you see the where you see the future of crowdfunding, and then and then we'll sign off for the evening. So Ben, uh, I'll start with you. The future of crowdfunding. Uh, do you have hope for unaccredited investor crowdfunding? Um, I'll, I'll let you kind of have the last word on that. Well, I mean, I, I think it's inevitable, but it, you know, whether it takes like another year or ten years, that that the that this is uh, inexorable. I mean, basically, that the idea that you end up with 3% of the population only available to do a form of e-commerce, which is internet investing, uh, won't stand over the course of years politically. But it's going to take, I mean, whether these rules uh, come change now, they will change. And, uh, and the internet has a tendency, I mean, it does have boom and bust, just like real estate does. But over time, it has a tendency to figure it out. And it will figure this out as well. And it will have all sorts of incredible benefits and, 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 and effects on the real estate industry as a whole. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Brian, uh, last word from, uh, from your side of the equation. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, I, I think the idea that 3% uh, of the population, or whatever the number is, is, is the only set of the population that's allowed to invest in these private equity type real estate deals or other uh, lucrative deals, I think is completely ridiculous. Um, but we have the rules that we have right now, so I, I think we're kind of taking a wait and see approach. We've got enough to get our arms around with trying to figure out Title II right now. So I'm hopeful that uh, Ben's right and the, you know, the power of the internet and the power of the crowd kind of wins out over time, but uh, there seem to be some powerful forces against uh, trying to protect everybody from, from you know, having lucrative investments right now. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Excellent. And, uh, and Justin, um, a couple last words from, uh, from you as well, um, from, from your perspective. Um, well, as I said before, I, I'm not using crowdfunding at the moment. However, you know, that's why I want to learn as much as I can about it. Maybe I have to change my business strategy as far as selling and equity. Um, however, it definitely seems like it's, it's opening up like a whole new chapter of how people can invest and, and do real estate um, to just both developers and also uh, investors that just want to invest in projects in the backyard or, and whatnot. So it seems very um, enlightening and uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for people. I'd love to get involved with more crowdfunding myself. 
Excellent. And uh, and Ben, would would you recommend that um, that Justin uh, sign up like uh, for your platform? Do you think he he should um, g give it a shot as far as uh, putting his deals through? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially you know, we have a social side to our our view of of real estate investing. And if you're a nonprofit investor today, or a nonprofit lender, I'd be interested to learn more about that. So you know, you can reach out to me. Or or join the site. Either way. Yeah, we're um, I'm actually we're closing on you know three units um Monday, and you know I have no problem just showing like the numbers, uh, the cash on cash, pretty much what we get out of the deal, what we put in for. Um, you know, there's already equity in it now because we already had appraised for after repair. So, but it's it's you know it's debt financing. I mean. We're looking to hold on to these. I could definitely give good returns, but I think there's certain investors that want to partake in our business model. But I would love to just send something your way and see if it's something that you guys would ever work with. Good stuff. Very good. All right. Well, uh, well, gentlemen, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on on a uh, on a Thursday night. It's it's a little bit late. Um, you know, to our viewers, thank you all for watching. I, I hope you guys are getting value out of the real estate series that we're putting on. It really is becoming one of the major industries that's really getting disrupted by the crowdfunding technologies and, and the movement that's occurring. Uh, so, gentlemen, once again, thank you all for joining us, and, and I'll end the show just like I end every show. Dream it, believe it, achieve it. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>